everything you eat has been modified. When it comes to plants, fruits, and vegetables, everything you put in your mouth has been modified one way or another. Cross-pollination, hybridization, open pollination, mutagenesis, and genetic engineering all change the makeup of food. The first four methods I mentioned are processes that can produce new strains of food. Can. Won't necessarily, but they can, and when they do, they are accepted into the food supply after appropriate testing. These are shot-in-the-dark best-guess tries. Some work, most don't. Mention genetics, and for many, it's an out-of-bounds topic. Franken-wheat, or Franken-tomatoes, or corn, or papayas from Hawaii. Yes, Hawaii, where three counties tried to enact laws forbidding genetically modified foods. But they were overruled by the state government and the courts. The debate, the rules, and the process of going into the lab and helping a plant or fruit fight off a virus or bacteria or be drought resistant is so onerous and very expensive that few companies are willing to invest their time and money. As Nick Saig, the host of No, as in K-N-O-W, No GMO says, it costs on average 10 years and 100 million plus dollars to deregulate a crop. He goes on to say, the delay is largely driven by the public fearing these crops. And these delays and the cost could very well mean we will never be able to grow the food billions of people will need. The gap between perception and what his research was telling him led Nick to create a video series about GMOs. I invited Nick Sake to join me for our conversations that matter, food for thought, about GMOs and what we need to know about them if we hope to feed the world of 2050. Hi, my name is Nick Syke, and lately I've had some questions surrounding what's true about our food. My dad's a baby boomer who grew up on a farm and he's worked in agriculture all of his life. Understanding each other isn't easy at the best of times and when it comes to food, we need science as a common language if we're going to make any sense of the other's point of view. And that's the goal. Join me while I annoy this guy with my skepticism as we search for the answers to my questions about our food. Welcome to Learn GMO. Oh, I'm hungry. Me too. All right, let's see what we got here. So Rob's job is to help farmers do the best job they can. Uh, I don't know. What do you want? God, I wanted like a chicken thing, but the tomatoes on that look really GMO. He likes technology. He loves GMOs. And he hates the idea that I might turn his grandson into a liberal snowflake with no appreciation for agriculture and no hope for the future, which he sees as a half full glass. This is how I see the future. I don't think we make it. And if we don't make it, what's the point of messing around with something as if he is GMO? Nicholas, the only thing GMO about those tomatoes is Photoshop. <laughs> you know, this advertising in here has really got a lot of us in agriculture upset. They advertise no hormones or steroids when they're the same thing. And quite frankly, there's way more hormones and steroids in the french fries than there'll ever be in the burger, you know? Uh, GMO. I'm pretty mm. skeptical of all of that that you just said. I did look this up. Hormones and steroids are the same thing. And potatoes do have a surprising amount of estrogen. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Nick, thanks for joining me. Yes, Stuart. Happy to be here. You put together a very interesting series called No GMO, as in K-N-O-W. K-N-O-W. Not no. Not no, but K-N-O-W. Why? Why was it important that you put together that series of videos? I, uh, I grew up in Alberta, um, grew up with one foot in agriculture. My dad and my dad's company growing up uh, was an agricultural consulting company. So they, um, they made a company around selling farmers unbiased advice that wasn't tied to selling fertilizer or chemical. So I always had um, an eye for agriculture. I spent a lot of time helping, um, you know, document and film my dad's company and kind of cut my teeth on that. And then uh, when I graduated film school, I moved out to BC uh, to get involved in the film industry out there. And um, I, long story there, but it, it, I found it a little bit disenchanting, actually. And um, having moved from 
Red Deer and from kind of conservative country into, you know, the pocket of kind of liberal West Coast culture, um, I found a lot of discrepancies between what I had learned about food and food production growing up and what I was hearing from my friends and from people I respected in that kind of culture. And um, they were really at odds with each other, fundamental differences in values and understanding about how food was produced. So. It was around that time that my dad um, got it in his head to uh, maybe produce a documentary about GMOs and about uh, these really divisive topics in agriculture. I was super willing to help out with that. It sounded like a great project. Um, we raised money to do it. We traveled all over the world. I directed this project. We went to Kenya, Uganda, um, uh, Hawaii, Florida, California, Missouri, all over, and uh, filmed the story of agriculture. Um, but as time went on, I started to recognize that, geez, maybe the assumption that a 90 minute film was the way to change minds was a big assumption. Um, and the more we thought about it, the more we realized that the audience we were trying to reach might be better served by shorter content that was more specific to topic. Um, I know personally, I find it difficult to sit through a film I disagree with. A 90 minute documentary makes me uh, you know, so I think that maybe that was asking a lot of people. So the reason we produced No GMO, the series, was to uh, was to give people just a, a basic understanding of why these tools are used in agriculture, what the pros, what the cons are, and and why this choice was made to go this direction in modern ag. You start off in that series questioning whether or not there is validity to genetically engineered foods. Yeah. As you went through the process of putting this together and you started to learn more and more, not only here in North America, but in other jurisdictions around the world, did that start to change your mind about the way or the role of genetic engineering? Did my view of GMOs change over the course of doing it? Um, yeah, I think it did. I think that I got a lot more nuanced of an understanding of it. I mean, like, like any other subject, when you're when you're looking at it from a really novice perspective, everything looks really black and white and really simple. And then when you go down a level and down a level and down a level, uh, it's that Dunning-Kruger kind of deal. You realize that there's so much more to it and nothing is inherently black and white. So what was the most important thing that you started to understand about genetic engineering? I think the most important thing I started to understand about genetic engineering was that it is, it is, it is not novel in the sense that this is just something we concocted in a lab through black magic and black science. This is, this is a logical and practical step up and step forward in processes we've been using since Mendel was messing with peas and learning pea genetics. We have been making small strides in plant husbandry for a very long time. You can go back even further than Mendel to the way that Native Americans grew corn. Um, we have been messing with plant genetics since the very beginning, often in ways more unknown than how we are doing it with genetic engineering in a lab. So yeah, I mean, I found that to be a very interesting fact and something that kind of allowed me to leave a lot of my trepidation at the door um, and just, just kind of learn more about it without having so many preconceived notions. If we were to take a look at the work of, let's say, Norman Borlaug, uh, yeah. the work that he did in Chapanga, Mexico, and we saw what he did with cross-breeding tens of thousands of uh, strands of wheat. Absolutely. Namely, to combat wheat rust. And he was successful. Yes. And this really helped to fuel a surge in being able to cross-pollinate. However, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about with the distinction between, say, hybrid breeding and with genetic engineering, I can, uh, I've often gotten away with kind of equating it to, it's the difference between, you know, writing a book with, uh, with a quill and ink versus typing it on a word processor. Fundamentally, you get the same thing out of it. You get an edible plant, right? The, the tools that you're using to get there, different and the process to get there different, but fundamentally the same end result in the way that I could write a scroll or I could you know, type a manuscript on a computer, I'm still getting my point across. And I think in that way, you know, we've always simply used the best tools at our disposal to make our food as edible and as beneficial to humans as possible. Uh, in Norman Borlaug's day, hybridizing wheat, combining two different kinds of wheat 
was revolutionary on a science level and on a breeding level. Today, what we're doing with CRISPR is revolutionary and moving things forward. Again, we're still doing fundamentally the same thing. We're trying to improve humanity's relationship with its food and, and make food better for humans. Well, Borlaug didn't have the benefit of genetic mapping. Yes. RNA, DNA, mapping of the particular strands that he was working with so that you could identify what a specific gene would express as. Right. And as a result, we're able to do this now with much greater precision. Well, and that's a that's a fantastic point as well. Is I mean, when you're when you're breeding, um, my wife and I are expecting a child in less than a month, our second our second son. Um, when my wife and I combine our genes, we are doing so in a random way. Um, I like to think I have good genes, and I'm pretty sure my wife does. So we can bet that the result is going to be you know, something okay, but you never know. You'd never know what the combination is gonna be when you're breeding. And from an efficiency level, that means that creating a new plant through selective breeding, through hybridization, takes a very long time and takes a lot of trial and error. To get one plant that has the traits you're looking for, you might have had to throw 10,000 plants away that didn't have what you were looking for. So it is a random combination game, and when you get the traits you're looking for, the, the desirable traits, often you're getting undesirable traits with that. So through modern processes, if we're able to weed out the undesirable traits, make that process happen faster and get from the lab to the field um, with less expense and with less time expended, I mean, that's what we need to feed an ever-growing population and especially to be adaptive um, in a world where the climate is changing and where things are, are just going to be different. Maybe we need to be adaptive with our crops and maybe genetic engineering is a way to do that. You went to Hawaii to look at the situation with papayas. What did you discover there? Because Hawaii is on record, or at least three counties in Hawaii are on record as saying no GMO. But without coming to the rescue of papayas, uh, we wouldn't have them if it weren't for genetic engineering. If you look at the counties that, um, that dislike GMOs and the counties that are for GMOs, what you'll find in Hawaii, by and large, is that the counties that are against GMOs are the coastal counties that aren't actually the farmland. The counties that are in favor of it are the ones in the interior where they're actually farming. So you get a lot of tourists and a lot of people who've moved to Hawaii who think no GMOs in this paradise. You get a lot of indigenous Hawaiians who are farming and trying to make it work who say, yes, we need this tool. What I have found is that the, one, the Hawaiians that I talked to, the people I talked to in Hawaii that grew papayas were very grateful that this technology existed. So you've also been to Africa. Yes. Yes, where country after country after country has been convinced to not accept any genetically modified foods. And we see populations that are undernourished. Does that break your heart? Yeah, it does. Uh, it really does. And... Um, Oh, it's such a tricky thing to talk about as a privileged white male living in North America. Um, I, uh, I have tried super hard not to be appropriative with my storytelling of Africa because I am not African. Um, and I think the real problem in Africa is that um, uh, we, can't help but, we can't help but go over there and be colonialists with our thinking, good or bad. I, I advocate for Africans to have technology and have access to technology if they want it if they want it. And um, what I was surprised about in Africa, when I got there, I think there was an assumption that I had that we had a lot of North American involvement over there and it was a lot of North American dollars funding what was happening. And that, that is the case. There is some North American involvement, but by and large, the genetic engineering that's coming out of Africa is by Africa for Africa. Um, we're, we're not talking necessarily about, um, about colonialist thinking with science. When I was in Africa, I was astounded by the amount of taxpayer dollars that have been, uh, that have been put into labs and into the technology there. Um, Bayer is not interested in making uh, brown mosaic streak resistant cassava. There's not a big market for that but Africa needs it. It's a staple crop. Um, you're not gonna find Syngenta working on bacterial wilt resistant bananas, right? It's, uh, it's a local problem that requires a local solution. And I mean, I just think that it doesn't matter where you farm, you deserve access to the chest of tools that every other farmer has. Will you choose the same tools? Probably not, but you deserve the same access as everybody else has. 
Well, let's come back to Alberta. There's a field behind you right now that has been prepped for planting, as a matter of fact. I think there's a farmer out there probably laying seed right at the moment. The process by which they are laying the seed now has changed dramatically, and it's thanks to a tremendous number of agricultural innovations, chemistry being one of them. In Canada, one of our, uh, one of our uh, pride and joys is canola. Um, as a crop, um, and canola uh, is, a, is a Canadian crop quintessentially. It actually, canola is Canada, can, ola, oil, can, Canadian oil, that's what canola means. Um, and we grow it in Canada, and we grow largely a, a variety, Roundup Ready or Liberty Link, another kind of pesticide resistant crop. And the idea there is that we can control weeds in Canada by using a chemical called Roundup or glyphosate, right? And because these plants have been genetically engineered to tolerate it, you can spray it on a field and it will kill everything but the crop. Now, the practical upshot of that is that farmers don't have to till their land to control weeds. In a garden, you might have to turn the soil to break up the weeds. Um, in a farming context, though, that is devastating for topsoil loss. It's devastating for the health of soil. Um, and so when you can no-till, when you can farm without having to till the ground, you're keeping all the carbon sequestered, you're keeping all of the nutrients in the field, and all of that really good earthy topsoil is there instead of blowing away in the wind. Um, to, to not even speak about the fact that use of Roundup has caused the use of other herbicides to absolutely plummet in the meantime. Okay, we are using a lot of glyphosate. There's no question about that. The use of glyphosate has skyrocketed. Is it overused? Arguably, yes, it is. Um, but if you're gonna overuse a chemical, uh, make it a benign one instead of a horribly toxic one. And contrary to popular belief, um, glyphosate is one of the safest chemicals we have in agriculture to do the job of feeding the planet. Do you find it difficult when you try to talk to somebody who has little connection with the land and with agriculture itself, someone like Michael Bloomberg, who said, I can teach anybody how to grow food. All you need to do is dig a hole, put a seed in the ground, cover it back up and pour water on it. And a voila, corn. So here's someone who doesn't know much, if anything, about farming, but he's willing to offer free advice, and he's not alone. What I've learned over time, uh, I have a first question that I like to start with, with anybody that I'm gonna get into a debate with. And what I say is, it doesn't matter what we're debating, we could be talking vaccines, climate change, GMOs. The first question I ask anybody is, what level of evidence would you have to see? What would you have to see to change your mind, right? Um, if the answer is nothing would change my mind, the conversation is not worth having, right? You already have, you can already tell by that one question if somebody is really coming at this with a lot of cognitive bias. If somebody says there is nothing in the world that would change my mind on this issue, they're not operating from a place of reason and they're not operating from a place of logic. Um, they're operating from a place of bias. And so that's gonna be a tough, battle to win. That's going to be a tough conversation to have. Well, you are a student of communication and you know that emotion plays a very powerful role in the way in which people respond. And the messages about genetically modified organisms have played out on that emotional component more than they have on the logical one. Aristotle laid out, you know, uh, logos, ethos, pathos, and the logic part in the discussion seems to go out the window. <sighs> it's it's understandable. Like I can't fault people for being in this position. Food is is something that whether or not it's marketed this way, it's something that is sacred. It's something you put in your body. It's something that nourishes you. Um, and I can understand people's trepidation with messing with that. I, I totally get that. Um, at the same time, I don't think people necessarily know our history with food, where we've come from, how we've gotten to here. There is no such thing as a natural piece of broccoli. There's no such thing as a natural any food we eat practically because everything has been so changed by breeding. I read Bill Clinton's book, the one that he published a few years after his presidency, and he talked about something that I've thought about a number of times when it comes to uh, communication campaigns. So you see one industry after another wind up in the crosshairs of an NGO or some other organization that wants to change the perception of that sector. The people in that sector don't say anything. They're not in the business of running social media campaigns. And they believe that, ah, well, it'll just go away. Once people understand the facts, it'll go away. 
But what Bill Clinton pointed out is that if you don't respond right away, that idea then takes root in the minds of people who have consumed it. And the fact that you didn't respond immediately says an awful lot to them because by the time you come to the game, it's too late. And it happens that, you know, the response really matters that you do it in the moment. So I know that's a little off topic here, but, but this is what I see has happened in uh, sector after sector after sector. So then how do we then, knowing this, disabuse people of the idea that the old ways of farming will be able to feed us and the people of the world? There's, there's a couple of things to that, and I know that um, uh, I'm going to say this, and it's a, t it's a tricky one being uh, fundamentally an advocate for agriculture, but this is where I say things get gray. Um, agriculture has, uh, has some blame cast on it in this. And one of these things that we see right now in, in genetic modification is that it's insanely expensive to get a new crop deregulated. Um, I was in Florida, in the University of Florida, seeing some, uh, some wonderful tomatoes that were resistant to a big tomato disease, um, genetically modified, unable to get to market because farmers weren't even willing to trial it because they were worried that their farms were going to get, um, you know, called out in the public for attempting to grow a new GMO. It costs on average 10 years and 100 million plus dollars to deregulate a crop. And that is largely driven by the public fearing these crops, right? So we have a public that's fearful, they lean on regulators, regulators increase the burden of regulation, and we get an expensive system. From what you've investigated so far, where do we go from here? I think that we, as, uh, as, as, the, as the sector marketing itself, we need to hold ourselves accountable because nobody else is doing it. So I think we need to do something similar to concern children's advertisers. I would like to see some, some effort like that placed in food so that we can hold food marketing to a higher standard. I don't like it when we see chemicals cast by fear because they're just hard to say. You know, I don't like this idea that natural is good for you, period, no matter what, and synthetic is bad. We need to, we need to get ahead of this marketing and, and disincentivize it. Well, thank you very much. And I hope that you can continue to explore this topic because I think the way that you're presenting it makes it easy for people to comprehend, understand, and then maybe, just maybe, ask more appropriate questions. Mm -hmm.